rebel force has penetrated the shield and landed on Endor. This is where the fun begins. A long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away. This is Rebel Force Radio. Your source for the Force. Star Wars news and commentary. With Jason Swank and Jimmy Mack. I've seen Star Wars 500 times. Star Wars number one. This station is now the ultimate power in the universe. I suggest we use it. Now it's time for Rebel Force Radio. We would be honored if you would join us. Chut, chut, everyone. Welcome back to Rebel Force Radio, your source for the force. Oh, big show this week. Huge. Huge. You you just love it. You live for when big Star Wars news just dropped right in your lap. Right in your lap before you start to uh, record the number one Star Wars podcast in the world. Yeah, but who's counting? We are... Yeah, yeah, but big show. We've got the uh, Book of Boba Fett trailer that just dropped. And um, we're going to break it all down for you here in uh, due time. Uh, Also, surprise Book of Boba Fett casting uh, confirmed. Uh, No spoilers uh, until we get to the story, but I tell you what. I'm a real maniac for this actress. I had to. I'm sorry. I I had to. I know. I know. Grown grown uh also <laughs> seth green uh talking a little bit more detours uh every it seems like everywhere this guy goes um he's got he's he's asked there's so much star wars going on and the question is obvious we've all been asking ourselves where's detours uh we heard rumors that it was going to be released uh some time ago back timed around may the 4th if i tell you what if a global pandemic wasn't enough and a, and a shortage of, of entertainment during the beginning part of that pandemic wasn't enough to pull detours out of mothballs. I don't know what is. Uh, also, some follow up to our, uh, our our spooky talk of the spirit of Qui-Gon. Um, we'll be talking a little bit more about that from last week. And uh, speaking of force ghosts, I, I sense a disturbance in the force. No, it's not a force ghost. It's my good friend and yours from Chicago, Jimmy Mack. Could be a force ghost. Luke. <laughs> Luke. Hey, Jason. Hey, Star Wars fans. So after you after you go off to uh, that big Star Wars podcast in the sky, is that how you're going to come through? I mean, you're still going to do the show even after you've passed on to the netherworld of the force, right? Well, I'll tell you, Swank. <laughs> the netherworld of the force. <laughs> Is a more dicey connection than Skype. <laughs> and you know how bad Skype? that is. We used to talk on Skype and it would all of a sudden <laughs> interrupt us while we were talking. <laughs> what, 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 what was that all about, Luke? Luke. La, 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 Luke. La, 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 Luke. Richard, <laughs> you have to you have to forgive Jimmy Mack. He's got his first uh, fan there in the office, and he's talking. We all did yeah, that. Well, didn't name we? the movie. Name the movie. Where, Tommy Boy. Uh, yeah, yeah. The great yeah. Chris Farley. Yeah, great oh. Chris Farley. What a loss. He lived in the penthouses at the John Hancock Center in downtown Chicago when I was working there on the thirty seventh floor. So we would often have Chris Farley sightings, often in his pajamas. Wow. Often at three in the afternoon. I mean, he was hard hard to miss, you know, if you saw Chris Farley. Mm -hmm. Still an unassuming guy. Yeah. Like, you know, when he walked in, it didn't seem like a movie star at all. He seemed very nervous and uncomfortable with his fame. And uh, he would have been great in a Star Wars movie, actually. Just give him a, a, a fan. Put it there on the table and let him do his thing. La Luke, Luke, I am your father. La 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 la. There it is. Yeah, he wouldn't even need uh, you know the special effects. He he brings his own special effects. Just a 
uh, a, a portable fan. Yeah. 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 Well, Farley was great, and uh, there's another Chicago actor who is going to be making a debut in Star Wars soon. We'll be talking about that later in the show. Yeah. Plus, uh, yeah, all the stuff Jason talked about and much more. Oh, not to mention there's been another Giancarlo Esposito sighting, and uh, he's doing panels at conventions and stuff and talking The Mandalorian. So uh, we got highlights of some of that as well. But what I need to know, what everyone needs to know is... How did Halloween go for you guys? And the, did you finish Ooh. the Mandalorian costume build on time? Everyone wants to know. Yeah, yeah, uh, I did. As a matter of fact, we well, we got most of it done. There were a few things that we we weren't able to get to. Um, most notably, the, the sidearm holster. We just couldn't make. We just couldn't get it done in time. Mm. But he uh, he had a ball. He, he looked great. He had uh, really all the armor, including some uh, under padding. He had the, uh, the tattered cape. Uh, he had the gauntlets. In fact, the gauntlets were really his, his, um, his doing. They were store-bought. In this case, they were store-bought. They were the ones that they sell, you know, like at Target and the, the toy stores where they have action features. Uh, but he, he doesn't like the paint job, so we had to customize them to make them more screen accurate. Um, but yeah, he, he had a great time. So I'm showing some, uh, some video here. You can also see some of this video on the official Rebel Force Radio Instagram feed. But uh, this photo, I think, really does it justice because you can see the great uh, uh, rifle, you know, the Mandalorian rifle. And he's got the, uh, the shells there for, for the disintegrator rifle. And uh, yeah, we, we had a good time. He, had, he got a lot of loot. There was one guy uh, on the street, a dad, who was greeting the kids with a Darth Vader mask. And it was the, the Black Series Darth Vader mask. And so I'm, I'm, come up to, I'm at the, uh, coming up to the door, you know, right behind Parker. And the, dad, and the dad looks at Parker and Parker looks at the dad and they're like, you know, it's like standoff. Vader versus <laughs> yeah, Mando. And all I, can, <laughs> all I can get out is, is that a Black Series? <laughs> and he like takes the mask off. I kid you not he takes the mask off and he goes like <laughs> you know makes all this sounds <laughs> it's this dude and he's like yeah it's, it's, it's great and he sh sh brings I go up on the porch and I'm looking at it and he's showing me all the buttons and and, and his w obviously his wife she goes oh they'll be here all day you know, <laughs> you know. <laughs> well I had a marvelous time in my Halloween uh, we do a five-hour window for trick or treating. Wow, like three to eight. So oh, I manned. Need to move to your neighborhood. I uh, I manned the front porch with uh, a bottle of wine. Oh, there's a picture of me right there, and I'm wearing my Mark Echo Chewbacca jacket, fully furred, with the bandolier and uh, hood up. Yeah, up. and it was it was kind of chilly. It chilly? Okay, yeah, it was it was chilly and uh, but so sunny. It, was, it looks like it looks like maybe oh, there's some beautiful. sun coming. In. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, well, it was it was actually a beautiful day. A little chill in the air, but really great day for the kids to be out trick or treating. I worked the porch all day. 104 kids, and uh, out of the 104 kids that visited my house, we had two Mandos and one Baby Yoda. So naturally, yeah. those kids got the extra. Oh, was it Lizzo? Candy. No, it was not Lizzo. <laughs> I heard she, I heard she well, dressed up been. as Baby Maybe Yoda. It <laughs> Maybe it was. I, I did not ask for ID or a song. But um, <laughs> it was funny because as I'm sitting on my porch, people could see me from across the street because you take steps to get up to my, my front door. And so I'm up there on the porch. And um, people would often say, hey, look, the Wookiee. There's a Wookiee. Mm. Look at a Wookiee. And they, they got it. to growl and stuff. But, and I was shocked that so many people identified me as the Wookiee and not Chewbacca. They would just say, there's wow. the Wookiee. There's the Wookiee. Well, I'm obviously not Chewbacca. But, right. you know, uh, if you use your imagination, I could be. And I was just surprised that so many people were identifying me as Wookiee. Well, you're, Wookie. well, you're not Tarful. I mean, who are you? I mean, you've got the you've got the bandolier. I mean, that's uh, yeah. The, the bandolier says Chewbacca. 
That's right. If I don't have the bandolier, I'm just a freak wearing a fur coat. <laughs> well, yeah, right. You just, people, you just, people might, you know, throw paint on me or something. Yeah, or milkshakes yeah. or something. I don't know. Well, you just but, look um, fabulous. Well, yeah, you know, I, I'm ready to go out uh, and hit the town. Yeah, but uh, no, I'm the Wookie, mm-hmm. and uh, and so the I neighborhood Wookie. I would hear people as they're approaching the house, I would hear them say, oh, the Wookiee, Wookiee. And I would walk (laughs) down with the candy and say, did I hear someone say Wookiee? Yeah. That always got a lot of laughs. Some people said, I really like your coat. And I'd say, it's not a coat. I'm just not wearing a shirt today. (laughs) And, uh, you know, so I had some shtick. I had some shtick. Do you think they might call you Wookiee if they see you in the neighborhood without the coat? Like, if you, is this now, are you identifying now as Wookiee? Well, I mean, others are identifying you as Wookie, so could just roll with so, it. Well, sometimes I'm really scruffy, and that could be, <laughs> uh, you know, considered to be a Kashyyyk resident. Uh, but no, lately I'm a little uh, better groomed. Mm. So uh, it, it was. It's I'm all coat. If I don't have the coat, I don't have the Wookie. You yeah, see, I, I'm looking. Yeah, I see. Because you had to go out on the town. The uh, the uh, Radio Hall of Fame awards were held in. Uh, in Chicago, and you were there, and I got you got a haircut and everything. For you I trimmed your haircut. beard. I I, I oh, got look groomed. At you. you can't go to a Hall of Fame ceremony without getting groomed. They want to groom you, and uh, so I did a lot of grooming, and um, I wore some kick-ass Star Wars stuff from Cufflinks.com, and oh, yeah. uh, it really came into play. It was just wonderful to have that stuff on me and people just didn't really even know. <laughs> mm. I mean, when I show them, they are like, Oh, that's the coolest thing I've ever seen. So I think next week we'll review some of the new products from cufflinks.com for star Wars fans, because they got some really great stuff. Oh, it's and, near uh, and dear to my heart. I wear yeah. uh, almost every day. I, the only dress shirts I own are French cuff shirts. I love French cuff shirts. <laughs> I love cufflinks. And uh, so I was thrilled when they came on board. That's great. And uh, I can't wait to, I'll, I think we'll actually be wearing the, the gear next week. So if you're not yeah. a member of RFR all access and you don't see the video, of mm-hmm. the show that you're listening to right now, you're going to miss out. You're going to miss out on some cufflinks, maybe a tie, maybe some colorful socks. We've got a lot of great things going on on our Patreon page lately, and uh, it's the beginning of a new month. And so usually that means uh, we lose a few patrons, you know, just a, a handful, nothing too overwhelming, but it just happens. And that's fine. Um, you know, I don't fault people for choosing to spend the money the way they want to spend it. But what I'm going to do is for the people who stuck around, especially this week, I'm going to be putting out a lot of content on Patreon. We've already released uh, Babu Freaks number 16, which is Tidy Whitey Freaks. Um, <laughs> you have to listen to the show to understand. Okay. <laughs> um, we have an RFR Q&A about Anya Solo. Does anybody remember Anya Solo? Probably not. But she was the star of a a short-lived Dark Horse comic series, Star Wars Legacy, book two. And uh, we talk all about it. And it's a great comic book. It it went under my radar when it came out. It was one of those final releases from Dark Horse right before the license, the comic book license, reverted back to Marvel. And they put this Star Wars Legacy arc out. And it was 15 issues. And it's so good and it really went under my radar when it originally came out so i recommend people read that listen to uh us on the q a the babu freaks are back and uh, of course along with early bird releases uh we've been getting really good about getting those out a day before anyone else can hear them and our far full show video for all access members and we've been getting really good about releasing that early bird as well so um you get it sooner you get it quicker and you get more of it no if you support rfr on patreon sooner more rfr on patreon stronger faster (laughs) more intense all right let's do it let's let's hit the headlines we got a trailer to watch i have good news for you my lord that's good news come closer i have good news yeah, there I was, minding my own business. 
not really thinking about anything in particular, and all of a sudden, bloop, I uh, I get a push notification on my uh, on my phone from YouTube. It says the Star Wars YouTube channel just dropped the Boba Fett trailer. I couldn't believe it. I wasn't. I got to be honest. I wasn't even thinking about a trailer. I mean, I um. I just, I've been living off of, I think a lot of us have been living off that prologue at the end of season two of uh, the Mandalorian. I just kind of thought, well, that's, that's sort of our teaser. You know, maybe we'll see something mm -hmm. as we get closer to December. Um, so I was surprised by this. I don't remember there being any rumors about a trailer dropping. There's a big Disney fan day happening on Disney plus next Friday, the 12th. Is that correct? Is that day correct? The 12th? Yes, um, on the 12th, and it's to celebrate the second anniversary of Disney+. Plus. With it is going to drop a special about Boba Fett. I don't know really what that's going to entail. Um, but about Boba about Fett the, the character or Boba Fett the show? I mean, I mean, I mean if about one, it's about the other probably, but... You got me. There must be a description out there somewhere, but there's going to be a Boba Fett special. And yeah, I think it's going to be sort of a retrospective look at uh, the history of the character and various mediums and, uh, and, and beyond, you know, yeah. maybe even something about the old rocket firing Boba Fett that we were talking about last week that was featured on Pawn Stars. <laughs> um, but I was expecting trailers to drop then on the 12th along mm -hmm. with their big second anniversary because it seems like they want to make it um, like an event. And I was thinking in terms of the big Disney Investor Day event from last year where they gave us the lowdown on all the shows they're working on and uh, information about those shows and Rogue Squadron, etc. I was hoping mm. for something maybe not as massive as that was massive, mm. but but something, you know, that we could sink our teeth into. And it might happen. It might happen. But for all we know, it's just the Boba Fett special that's going to happen on the 12th. That's when I thought they were going to drop the Mandalorian trailer. Mm. It's on the 12th. Mm -hmm. So to, to get up on a Monday morning... And notice, I, I noticed that there was an extra amount of Book of Boba Fett social media activity going on from the official Star Wars accounts. And so I said, hmm, something's up here. And then, you know, sure enough, kept clicking through, found the trailer. There it is. And uh, so I, I, I have to admit, you know, watched it a couple times. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't do uh, too much of the freeze framing or anything like that. But uh, there's some good eye candy in here. There is, and I I think we're gonna we're gonna cruise through it and Let's give our it. thoughts on it. Let's so do Jason it. We'll has the trailer. It. We will take it frame by frame here, or Ooh, moment by, by moment. Frame. No, moment by moment. Uh, where are we at? Where's... Okay, let's let's play it up here. Bring me Boba Fett. All right. Get so this that. appears to be Tatooine with the Bomar Monk. Yep. Yeah. Bomar Monk. I'd recognize yeah. that uh, little bowl <laughs> anywhere. Uh, and this is great. I mean, because this right out of the gate, uh, you see the Bomar Monk and then you see Jabba's palace in the background. It's like, OK, you know exactly where you are. Uh, it, it orients you within the galaxy. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, yeah. go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. That's right. You had three things to say. I want to hear what the third thing was. I don't even remember anymore. <laughs> Only... <laughs> Yeah, it's early. It's early in the morning, and I could tell because only one sun has risen. Oh, we still have another sun. Ah. and the monk. Everyone remembers the Hasbro mail away for the Bamar monk yep. action figure when it was first released, and that featured a brain floating in a jar of blue liquid. Correct, formaldehyde, whatever it is. <laughs> They re-released the Bomar Monk a few years later. I think it was in a multi-pack. And the Monk had the red liquid in the tank. So now I imagine that action figure is going to skyrocket in value because it has the red liquid. Yeah, it's the off-world. Um, it's the off-world. Off off exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, welcome to the Mandalorian. But this Bomar Monk is definitely on-world. 
and it's at Jabba's palace where we right. know they hang. The The legend is the palace was a Bomar monk temple that Jabba took over. Yeah. And he allowed the... Can you imagine? What happens? Can you imagine? Yeah, gangsters move into the church. Right. But Jabba, in his infinite wisdom and generosity, almighty Jabba, he allowed the monks to continue to hang at the temple slash now palace as long as they didn't interfere in any of his underworld happenings. Mm. And the story about the monks is that they're regular dudes like us, but to achieve spiritual enlightenment, they saw their skulls open, remove their brains, put the brains in these fish bowls, and then attach the fish bowls to the walking spider legs for mobility. So they achieve greater spiritual what did I say? Spiritual enlightenment. Enlightenment. Yeah. Enlightenment. Yes. I, yes. I, the total, total spiritual consciousness. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm trying to think of what Bill Murray says in uh, Caddyshack after meeting the Dalai Lama. He's like, <laughs> total spiritual awakening. Um, I, I'm getting the I mean, this wrong. is real. I mean, this is real commitment. I mean, you think about what monks in our real world go through. I don't think any of them have hit, gone so far as they have their brains taken out of their skulls and thrown in a yeah. fishbowl yeah. attached yeah. to a spider. Um, it's wild. This is the kind of thing that can only come from the mind of George Lucas. I do have to say. It, it's just, this it's is twisted. the kind of thing. Yeah, it's very twisted. It's very twisted and creepy as hell. Yeah. And so you have now... This monk and, and George actually requested this thing to be created for Jabba's palace because he envisioned a a spider assassin, mm. but it was something that wasn't really anything that grew into part of the story for Return of the Jedi. But he asked his design guys to create a spider assassin or something, you know, droid mm. spider assassin. And so they then developed this whole look for the brain in the goldfish bowl attached to the mechanical spider legs. And I don't know if they actually ever got the effect to really work so great because you only see it in the background yeah. after 3PO and R2 walk in. You see it in the background. Oh, 3PO gets Luke freaked it. out. It's, yeah. Oh, 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 oh hideous. <laughs> um, but you really can't make out too much of the detail like you can in this shot. This yeah. is a real hero shot of the Bomar monk, something unlike anything we'd ever seen before. Um, the idea for the assassin was obviously dropped in the expanded universe era when the, the spider became the Bomar monk and the whole story about the, the monks and the enlightenment and all and the brains that all was invented for a book, uh, Tales from Jabba's Palace, I mm. believe is the first place we heard about that. Yeah. But to me, they're hitting a home run out of the park with the first shot of this trailer. It's it's definitely some Star Wars eye candy that uh, is uh, total wish fulfillment, you know, to see well, yeah. and the Omar Monk moving like that. Right, and this is, this is where... You know, we'll talk, we'll give our capsule judgments of the trailer uh, afterwards, but uh, I'll just put it this way. This is uh, this is a top five highlight moment of this trailer. This trailer is like mm -hmm. a minute and a half long, and the first shot was one of my favorites. And, you know, anytime we get a chance, and this is what I loved so much, one of the things I loved so much about The Force Awakens, and then it seemed to be dropped in the, in the subsequent sequels, but anytime we get a chance to see something so familiar... And we get to see new shots of Jabba's palace throughout this trailer. Something that's so familiar to us, like I, I could, I could draw it, you know, blindfolded, because um, I've lived with this imagery and these characters. And when you get to see it just from a different angle or from in a way you've never seen it before, that's when the magic really happens uh, for me as a fan. Um, so yeah, so mm -hmm. yeah, new footage of Jabba's palace with a Bomar monk in the foreground. Yeah, yeah, I'll take it. I will take it. It's now, just so a surprising line. to see that they 
actually leave the palace too, which is something I never considered eh. that they were just cruising around the terrain of Tatooine. Cause they got chores, they got things <laughs> in running errands. Yeah. Right. Uh, all right. So there's a line of dialogue. I just was freeze frame. Ah, uh, okay. Well, there's a line of dialogue there. We, 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 we missed it, but he says that uh, he's, n- he's no bounty hunter. So, one of the first things we hear about Boba Fett say, I am not a bounty hunter. And then there's a character saying, yeah, that's not what I've heard. So mm. there's speculation. Is he trying to become uh, uh, legitimate? Is he trying to divest himself of his, his uh, bounty hunting ways? Uh, wh- wh- what's the story? I mean, I mean, when you think bounty hunter in the star Wars universe, Boba Fett is the first character that comes to your mind for most, Mm -hmm. for most fans, for most people. Uh, So here you've got, that's, that's like seeing a trailer for a Darth Vader, you know, a Darth Vader or something. And he's like, you know, I am no Sith Lord. Like what, 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 what? when did this happen? How did this happen? This is, or, or seeing a trailer where Luke Skywalker is like the Jedi must end. I mean, (laughs) what's that? all about? I mean, could you imagine (laughs) <laughs> yeah all right something like that oh no they would never do that but anyway so he says he's no bounty hunter and then you hear this authorian which, which, which later you learn is this authorian character uh say that's not what i've heard um but uh yeah so we'll see why is he why is he not identifying as bounty hunter anymore strange mm-hmm. now uh a lot of people are talking about tim morrison's appearance Facial appearance. Yeah. The show vastly different from what we saw in the Mandalorian. And there are two schools of thought here. Number one, some of this stuff is a flashback. So it happened prior to him getting scarred and deformed in the Sarlacc pit, or he took a back to bath and I'm leaning more toward the latter back to bath. And Mm. I, I, I want to point out the thing that you see to Boba's right in this shot. It looks like a sort of thing that a chamber you might lay down in and pull that that cabinet door down on top of you. Do you see what I'm talking yeah, about? I do see that. It almost yeah. like a coffin, like a coffin. Okay. Where you can pull that. And that could have been some sort of back to rejuvenation tank. And he's just emerging from it now, mm-hmm. and he's putting mm-hmm. his armor on. I see. That's that's what I. That's my speculation. I don't know if anybody else has been talking about this online, but um, so he's that's taking what better I care of his is. skin. He wants to get rid well, yeah. of all of the yeah. Uh, yeah yeah the 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 scarring and the burn marks and all of that. Yeah. What well, what when we get through this, we'll we'll show you. We've got some uh, photos of the before and after. We'll take a look at that, but yeah. So I think that could be some sort of back to tank, like kind of similar to the thing Finn is lying in at the beginning of episode eight when he's, Oh yeah. Uh, right. He's got the back to suit on. Maybe we'll have Boba with a back to suit on. I prefer the free floating in the tank. Uh, yeah. Mark Hamill, <laughs> Empire Strikes Back. With the big or, diaper on. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, diaper is, that's a prerequisite. It has to happen. <laughs> um, or even, you know, Darth Vader in the back to tank in Rogue One. That's good stuff. Yeah. So this, so is like like back back to, this is more like a back to this is more like a back to tanning bed, I think that uh, he's got okay. going on. That's more what it looks like. A tanning bed, not a coffin. A yeah. tanning bed. So he sat in there and instead of catching UV rays, he is catching back to sprays. <laughs> <laughs> Sprays, not rays. I like it. Uh, all right. So here he is putting the helmet on. There's some more dings to his armor, by the way. Uh, you know, yes. at the end of uh, Mando season two, he was like, mm-hmm. he had just got the airbrush out and painted. Right, them. right. Yeah, that was very fresh. But he's been on some adventures since then. I think so. This you is see the Lucasfilm cool. logo. Yeah. Yeah. Like the Lucasfilm it's logo with the boba colors. Boba colors. Uh, this is some very casual Star Wars um, denizens. I know mm-hmm. that you sit on the throne. Call them the denizens. The All right, freeze frame. Yep. We have an Athorian and a Twi'lek. And uh, 
the, the place, uh, the walls remind me of some Ralph McQuarrie concept art designs. Yeah. I don't, I don't know if that's actually accurate, but, um, it's kind of what it reminds me of things I've mm. seen before. And then this cat, he's sitting in a throne of some sort, almost looks like a captain's chair on board a Federation starship. <laughs> Yeah, but he's got some uh, knickknacks scattered about. I think this is another, I, I, I'm led to believe that this is maybe another gangster, another boss, yeah. uh, another member of a, you know, from another leader of a, of a family, a crime family or something. Wearing a caftan mm -hmm. and he has the Athorian translator device hooked up to his head because Athorians have two mouths. On both, you know, one mouth on each side of the head, and they speak in stereo. And so he has the little translator microphones on both sides, and then that translates what he's saying from Athorian into. I know people who speak basic. out of both sides of their mouth. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I've been employed by many of them over the years. Oh, uh, all right. So we got the Athorian. That's 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 pretty cool. You know, you, a hammerhead. I'm all about it. That's great. And it, it, and it, thank God for the Mandalorian and Filoni and Favreau. They're giving us those familiar creatures that we have. Yeah. You yes. Know, I mean, right out of the gate, we, you know, they're not messing around with these fleshy pink colored, uh, you know, JJ Abrams type monsters. No, we've got a, we've got a hammerhead and we've got a Twi'lek. Boom. There you go. And the monk and the Bomar monk. Right. This uh, aerial shot of um, some sort of uh, city, uh, maybe city in the valley. Of yeah. Well, okay. A lot of people have been speculating this is a city on Tatooine. It could be part of Mos Eisley that we never saw before, or a larger look at Mos Espa. Mm -hmm. But I think that this city is too massive to be on Tatooine. I agree. This is not it's the planet like, of the farthest from the center of the universe. This is yes. yeah, too populous. Too populous. It's too big, uh, too widespread. That's too much activity for Tatooine. It's too much action for Tatooine, a city right. like this, a sprawly metropolis like this. It's very impressive. It, it reminds me of Jetta City a little bit. Yes. Just simply for the fact that it's, it's yes. sunk down. Paul Bateman had a few things to say about this. He, he was really just blown away by what they can do on a TV budget. And he, uh, let's see here. What did Paul have to say? Oh, my notes are messed up. He says, uh, looks like an early Moss Espa design Doug Chang created for the Phantom Menace. Mm. And then he put the artwork online Oh, okay. So we can, um, we, we can, that we, we can show that at the end here. Once we get, yeah, we'll this. show that at the end. We'll talk about yeah. it at the end, but that's uh, what Paul's uh, comparing it to. He has some Doug chain concept art from the prequels. Yeah. You definitely see like in, in, in that Valley and you see the, the, the structure. Yeah. Very similar. Very similar. All right. Let's see. Moving along here. Oh, and they great, There's great shot of the throne. Um, doesn't have to be quite as big as it used to back in Chapa's day, but uh, no, no, it's, it's bib sized. Yeah, it's a bib sized throne. <laughs> yeah, I do. Hold with fear. But uh, now he's talking about the difference here between the way Jabba ruled and the way that um, that that he intends to rule. He says Jabba ruled by fear. And then I think he, he follows it up with saying, I will rule by respect or something along mm -hmm. those lines. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, he, right, right away here, we know that he, he intends to be a different type of leader, a different type of, of, of crime boss. It's not about um, making people, uh, you know, doing th people doing things because they don't want to be fed to the rancor. It's, it's about maybe adding a layer of respect and honor, I suppose. Um, yeah, I guess, you know, like what you would see with the mafiosos and yeah. stuff, you know, kiss, kissing the godfather's ring, 
things like that, I, I think is more what he's leaning toward as opposed to just being a brute. Right. Who, right. You know, because he probably considers that to be part of Jabba's downfall is uh, just being a, a brute and doing things, you know, torturing people, marching them on the plank and all of this business. <laughs> a little theatrical, a, huh? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and just for his own selfish pleasure. He's yeah, taking, right. Bubba was taking his eyes off the prize a little too often. Uh -huh. And I think Boba's looking to remedy that with some uh, new age management style that he's going to be bringing <laughs> to the table. I'm going to be bringing in 360 reviews. We're all going to sit around. If a Gamorrean comes to me and says, boss, I need a mental health day, I will be very <laughs> understanding. <laughs> yeah, right. It's going to get all uh, all modern. There's going to be foosball tables in the break rooms at Jabba's Palace. Yeah, right. right. It'll be like... <laughs> Yeah, it'll be like Apple. Yeah, right. where they, you know, they have like weird little things in the lobby, like a yeah. a ping pong ball pool that you can jump into, or just like real excessive stuff. Yeah, all right. So I take care of my employees, and then I send them on vacations to the Polynesian Spa in New Zealand. Ah, New Zealand. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we see some action here. Uh, uh, here's the, we, we actually see another actor. Oh. Um, and I wasn't talking about Ming-Na Wen, who we know is in this show, but the dude, there's a, a, apparently this is one dude. of the guards. Uh -huh. uh, th this must be uh, one of the thugs working for the Athorian boss mm -hmm. because they're in the same, the same. Yeah, you can tell by the, room, if you the, the walls there, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and some people were spreading a rumor online that this particular actor is, is Daniel Logan. Uh, that's not true. <laughs> that is not yeah, true. Not that Daniel is not Logan. Daniel Logan. No, sir. This guy's got maybe 10 years on Logan. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, he looks much different. But it's a new type of guard mm -hmm. jumping into action here, uh, getting into a firefight with Boba and Fennec. Yeah, you don't want to do that. It looks like it's a little bit of a standoff. And then you see, uh, by the way, just for the record, these skinny Gamorians. Yeah. See, the, yeah. Can we get a fat Gamorian guard? What happened uh, after Jabba died? All the Gamorians mm -hmm. dropped uh, 100 pounds? Uh, Jenny Craig. It was is that what Jenny it is? Craig. Yep, yep. She's going to be in um, the third episode. Jenny Craig herself is going to be there. And um, I mean, I get that they uh, want to show variety uh in the species but you know mm -hmm. in last time i checked return of the jedi they were all they were all fat they all looked exactly the same um how many gamorians do you think you actually see in return of the jedi all right how many do you actually see i'm gonna say gamorians i'm gonna say if i went back and counted i, I think we're talking about four or five yeah, that's probably right. I mean, I don't have an answer for you. Yeah. Uh, that, that'd be something fun to do next time you watch Return of the Jedi and just kind of keep track of how many Gamorreans you actually see. Well, there's the two at the, the front door. There's the two right. at the front door. Then there's the one that gets killed. It gets eaten by the, uh, by the Rancor. Right. And then there's the one that's laughing his butt off at the one getting eaten, which I always thought was oh, okay. pretty sick. One, he's just like, yeah. he's like holding his belly. He's laughing so hard. If you, if you know <laughs> that guy. Yeah. Yeah. He's really having well, a good time. Maybe that Gamorrean had a really attractive Gamorrean wife and she would be back on the market in the event of his unfortunate demise. And so that other Gamorrean's been waiting for this to happen. It couldn't happen soon enough. He wanted to make the moves. Well, it couldn't happen soon enough. This is I like think, a Seinfeld episode going on in Jabba's <laughs> Palace. But I'm just looking at this Gamorrean guard, and I'm like, he had that stomach stapling surgery. He's like Al Roker walking around there now. It's like, I don't know what to make. You know, he just doesn't look quite the same. I'm glad they're healthier. You know, I'm glad for him. But selfishly, I want I want the big, mm -hmm. fat Gamorrean guard with the, with the fur, furry skirt. In reality, though, I mean, if you want to think about this practically, uh -huh. um, We've been introduced to Gamorreans, two of them, in the, the Mandalorian season two. Yep. They were wrestling, remember? Oh, yeah. I'll bet you anything that these are the exact same two Gamorreans with a few costume tweaks. Yeah. Just to keep the budget on the 
down yeah. low and, and, and just reuse that because I find it very unlikely that any original Gamorrean costume still exists no, from the early the, 80s. The, the latex and all that, that starts to right. deteriorate. But you know they could they could certainly replicate it, um, but they don't. They obviously don't want to, or they would. You know, I mean, it's not like they don't know what the Gamorians looked like in Return of the Jedi. I'm just saying, I'm hoping for a fatty Gamorian guard. That's all. That's fair. That's yeah. fair. I mean, give you me don't a fat one see, and a skinny one. You don't go to see sumo wrestling to see a couple of twigs run at each other in the <laughs> ring. You, you want to see some big beefy dudes going at it, you know. That's that's right. With all that's... the power that they bring. So okay. Yes. <laughs> all right. And More here's Gamorian. Ming Na Wen, you know, uh she uh, bathes in the fountain of youth every day. This woman's absolutely beautiful. And I love her character and I love what she brings to the uh to the Star Wars universe. And uh yeah, I just she yeah. she steals the she steals this the uh the scenes when she's in them. Yeah. She's There's something great. so chill about her. Yeah. She just goes through these these episodes as Fennec Shan just with, with such coolness and confidence that I think is, is something pretty cool about Now, you've her, gone so. on record, Jim, as saying that you believe that she is an android, that we're going to find out that she I, is an know, android. I now, think that could be true yeah. because she takes that, that blaster bolt into the stomach. Mm-hmm. And when they question her return, she slides open that panel in her abdomen and shows off mechanics in there and just right. closes it up. And so you can think to yourself, oh, well, they used those sort of cybernetics to heal her. But what if she always has been a, an android? And she's just saying, hey, you can shoot me, but these circuits can be repaired. Yeah. That's what I was, I, I was thinking. I, you know. Common sense tells me that she became an android out of necessity because of the blaster bolts. But I'm just presenting that as an alternative to what most people okay. assume about the character. Well, all right. But I, I don't know. Because even though we're talking about Star Wars and it's a galaxy far, far away and you have to suspend your disbelief. I mean, it, it's obvious that she had been lying there after she was... Uh, presumably killed, but certainly shot in the stomach at point blank range by that guy. I can't think of his name, but he's so annoying. Um, in, in season one. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so she must've been laying there a long time. She would have bled out. So I, I, I actually think that you're onto something. I don't think that she was fixed after that. I think she was, she was part machine before she took that blaster to the to the stomach because otherwise i don't how would she have survived that more machine than woman yeah. twisted and evil yeah it also explains why she doesn't age all right so there wow. she is there you go <laughs> oh. now here you can really see uh jim now uh this shot here of tim morris and his boba fett taking the helmet off this very well may be some sort of a flashback however the flight suit underneath looks yeah pretty much on par with, with, with new, new fat. We have not seen, uh, as far as I know, spoiler alert in this trailer, classic fat, classic original trilogy fat. Look, though, I think it's inevitable that we will see that in this series, but I don't think we see it at all in the trailer, but his no, skin is much better, noticed. much yeah. better. Yeah. So that rules out flashback considering he's wearing the, uh, the black cloak undergarment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As opposed to that gray mechanic suit, flight suit, whatever you want to call yeah. it. Yeah. And that's the device I thought they'd really be using to, to show the difference between flashbacks and current timeline Boba. Mm. So we'll have to wait and see if, I mean, there might not be any flashbacks at all. I find that hard to believe though. I think there will be. I I, I think yeah, that I do too. I think there's going to be, if I had to guess, at a, a whole episode almost where he recounts what happened to him after the the the, the mm -hmm. after Jabba. I mean, maybe he sits there and tells that Athorian crime boss what happened. Oh, yeah. Jabba! I thought Jabba, you know, died. Well, let me tell you what happened. You know, um, that would be great. I'd love to see it. I think we will see it, and um. 
again, I, I want to talk a little bit about what we don't see in this trailer and why it sort of frustrates me a little bit when we get through. But there's a lot to love. All right, so there's Boba taking the... So we've seen him take the helmet off, put the helmet on. There's a lot of helmet, you know, back and forth. Mm -hmm. Well, unlike the Mandalorian, respect. he doesn't right. necessarily abide by that creed. Streaming exclusively on Disney+. Plus. You all once Beautiful shot aerial Jabba. shot there, yeah, of... of, of uh, of Jabba's palace coming in from a, from a different angle. Um, yeah. That's not the angle that we see three PO and R2 approach it looks in, like uh, something's in Jedi. There. Yeah, there does. Like, is it a person on a speeder bike or is it somebody walking? Is it? Yep. You're right. What is it? I, I'm actually scratching at my screen. <laughs> you know, it's not it's your like screen because I have it on mine too. <laughs> came out from between my teeth and just landed on the screen, but there it is. <laughs> Uh, all right. Let's see. Once captains under Jabba. The okay, so you were once captains under Jabba the Hutt. She's saying, and these are a bunch of uh, what are these guys with the Trandoshans? <laughs> are they? Yeah, well, they not are. all of them. Some, some of them are. There's some are Clatuinians. Clatuinians. Hey, you know what we missed in that shot? What? Hold on, I got to go back real quick. I got to go back to the shot of uh, Tim Morrison. I was just looking at the picture Winnie. and maybe you, he's got eyebrows. Yes. Yes. He doesn't have that any eyebrows uh, mm -hmm. when we first meet him and when he's wearing the, right. you know, the, the, the robe and he introduces mm -hmm. himself to the Mandalorian. Yeah. So man, Star Wars in the eyebrows, you know, first Sebastian mm -hmm. Shaw has eyebrows. Then he doesn't have eyebrows. Now Boba Fett has doesn't have eyebrows. Now he does have eyebrows. Maybe he has yeah. Sebastian Shaw's eyebrows. Yeah, that was his first bounty. Actually, <laughs> was to hunt down Sebastian Shaw's eyebrows. <laughs> oh man! All right, so yeah, there here's the yeah Clutunians, um, the uh, Trandoshan. Yeah, these uh, guys. assuming this meeting here. Yeah, Clatuinians. Cl oh, yeah, sorry, Clatuinians. Clatu N E N. Um, Assuming this is inside Jabba's palace. Yes. In some little banquet room he has. I thought Jabba would have a more elaborate and grandiose uh, banquet room, you know? Mm. But this just looks like a little dining room there. You see steps coming down. He rents it out for machine. parties for some income, uh, you know, some revenue uh, diversification there. It's a great Boba place to have your holiday party. The table. Yes, he is. Um yeah, I was trying to see if there are any other creatures there, but so these are all captains and and if you're a, you know, if you're one of those that likes to watch mob documentaries and stuff like that, we know that captains or uh cap regimes as they're called are sort Capo, of the yeah. capos, they're the yeah. the lieutenants, you know, in the organized crime family. Um and so I mean now they're making an offer. They're saying, "Look, pledge yourself to us." You know, this is we're going to we're going to make you rich. Yeah, Boba wants to consolidate all of the different crime syndicates under one roof, and um, and he wants to call it a corporation. So it's going to be like Star Wars Underworld Incorporated. <laughs> I I like that he's being honest about it. You know, in in real world, corporations try to pretend they're not criminal organizations. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we might as well call ourselves a corporation. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it's called yeah the 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 Boba Corporation. <laughs> yes, I secured the URL over the weekend. <laughs> we also have all social media accounts. <laughs> now he needs a, someone to do PR for him. Although it sounds like Phoenix doing it. That's mutually beneficial. She's the PR person. Oh, you have some Aqualish there. Oh yeah, look at those guys. Yeah, they look great. Walrus man's. Because one of these, oh, I love this shot right here. This is one of my favorites. I think they, maybe they come back to it, but this balcony shot of Fennec yeah. and Boba. Again, what I love so much is seeing like other rooms of Jabba's palace, like all the stuff that used to play in my imagination as a kid. Um, you know, I just, I dig it so much. That's really my favorite part of this, this, this whole trailer mm. is the, um, the familiar shown in a, in a less familiar way. Um, this appears to be the exterior of the shot we see at the very beginning of the trailer when Boba is uh, coming. We, we think he's coming out of that rejuvenation mm. tanning bed and he's putting his <laughs> yeah. helmet on. Um, I believe he is inside this room because of the curtains. 
Ah, okay. There are similar curtains in that shot in the background where you see Boba putting the helmet on. So uh, this appears to be Jabba's boudoir. Yeah. So so we get uh, what's, Jabba's master bedroom here. What's what's proving, Boba's and we're about Boba. halfway through the trailer, what's proving to be the case is that we are seeing a lot of the same in this trailer. We're seeing a lot of cuts and angles from the same little bit of way. They're actually showing us very little here. Very, very little, I think. Agreed. Agreed. Um, I do love that balcony. Why speak of every game? Tuscan oh, Raiders? Yeah. So, Jim, this could be a clue that they're going to show how he ended up wearing those, those Tuscan robes and uh, carrying the gaffy stick. This might be part of that flashback. Is, yeah, as a matter of fact, Boba might be one of these. I'm thinking Boba is the one on the far left because mm. it appears almost like that guy has the darker under cloak that Boba has been wearing. Okay. That darker cloak. It appears that he's wearing like a more sandy colored outer cloak like a Tuscan would normally wear, but it appears that it's darker underneath. See, like from his his waist on down, it just looks mm -hmm. darker to me. I mean, it's hard to make out in this shot, but I had assumed that Boba was riding with the Tuscan Raiders for a little while, just to survive. Yeah, and maybe they accepted him as one of their own, and uh, we've seen that humans have the ability to communicate with Tuscans in the Mandoverse, and so that's going to probably continue here with Book of Boba Fett, and. Uh, I assume that Boba was riding with the Tusken Raiders for a while because that explains his absence from the scene after surviving the Sarlacc pit. So this could be a flashback or this could be, these guys could be approaching Jabba's palace because Boba invited them to join the corporation. Wouldn't that be wild? That would be wild. Can you imagine? Trying to tame the Tuskens. <laughs> I'd like you to meet some friends of mine. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> Who invited these guys? Wow, All right. Man. Over the top intro. Oh, what do we got? We got a uh, pulling a weapon out here. Is this Fennec? somebody's pull? That looks like Fennec. Yeah. yeah. Oh, a little. There's a little dagger she pulls out of uh, sort mm. of the, the the butt of her of her blaster. That's cool. And uh, yeah, cool. and now they're entering something that appears to be a, maybe another cantina or something. Yeah. When corporation can make us open all the rich. curtains. Hey, There's who's that? <laughs> a couple of Twi'leks. Yes. Ah, uh, we'll get to that in a little bit. But if that uh, Twi'lek looks familiar, there's a reason why. There's the slave one. Slave one. Always Probably and forever. Known to, uh, Known to newer fans as Boba Fett Starship, the uh, exotic name Boba Fett Starship. <laughs> but uh, no, it's always going to be the slave one to us uh, stubborn old school fans. And uh, it's great to see that thing in flight. I loved seeing the slave one in action in The Mandalorian season two. So we'll be seeing more slave one. That was kind of a no brainer coming into this, but nice to get confirmation nonetheless. For sure. All right. What prevents us all? Oh, yeah. Back so this is when meeting. he's starting to get mouthy. He goes, well, what, what prevents us from just killing you? From killing you and taking you. We haven't been served want. dessert yet. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. You see, there, there's Boba Fett's helmet, and uh, it appears to be filled with Republic credits or uh, some sort of money. Yeah. Coins. Uh, does that look like money to you? The balloons. It yeah. It's definitely, it looks like some sort of currency. I think we're supposed to assume i guess he was taking you know he, he i guess we'll see boba fett doing some panhandling uh maybe some uh some busking on the street corner uh <laughs> or just working the subway in moss espa you know just well we you know we did see tim morrison on the set of episode two as Django fett doing a little a little soft shoe with the umbrella remember those clips yeah yeah dancing for tips yeah Spare some change if you would be so kind. I'm taking donations for my high school basketball team. Or um, maybe he throws yeah, them in there just happening. to make the helmet fit a little better. You know, like little little wedges. It's the only place he he keeps his money. Well, that's so true. Keep it in their shoe. He just keeps it up here. I keep it up here. 
I got my mind on my money and my money on my mind. <laughs> Sipping gin and juice. It is a bit of an eerie uh, <laughs> image of the, and, and kind of uh, reminds you a little bit of the, you know, the Django helmet rolling across the uh, Geonosian uh, sand. Um, in this case, there's money dropping out of it and not a uh, severed head of Django Fett, but you know, just what it reminded me of a bit. There's some skirmish going on around, around them. these guards that we were talking about earlier. There's more of them here, and we see they have some sort of uh, uh, laser-generated shield that comes off their gauntlets. That's very cool. cool. Yeah. I mean, have we seen that in Star Wars before? I think we have, um, maybe on a smaller scale. Aren't the Gungan shields, the uh, aren't they sort of Yeah, generated? they're similar to that. Yeah. You're right, the Gungan Shields, of course, a classic. Um, also, I, I remember the Mando had little shields on his gauntlet, didn't he, that he was using to deflect blows yes. from yes, he did. From Moff Gideon and the Darksaber. So, uh, yeah. yeah, the shield technology, we're seeing this again. And I, I, I think we even saw it in the Clone Wars at some point as well. Uh, I think you're right. That does sound familiar. Um, so this it looks like one of those moments where they realize they're outnumbered and then maybe someone, what I got the feeling that this was the moment that someone is coming to help them or like, cause th th things look pretty hopeless probably for Fennec and Boba at this point. And then this is sort of a moment of, uh, yeah, something's about to change. Stand off. And, oh, and then, so he's got that. <laughs> he has that, that, that psycho. That crazy look in his eye again. Yeah. Look at him. Look at it's, him. Uh, it's the psycho Tim Morrison look when he's dancing his his hakas. <laughs> Have you ever seen him do that? I, I saw him do it in Japan. He started just getting up, dancing the haka. And I, I think they showed it in some behind-the-scenes footage from The Mandalorian Season 2. Mm. But yeah. it's a, a Maori thing mm -hmm. where he does a, a tribal dance called a haka. And part of the display is to stick your tongue out and make crazy faces. And so it looks like Tem is incorporating some of that into Boba Fett's fighting style. And I think that's cool as hell. I love this. Yeah, I love it. And it reminds me when we first saw him in action in Mandalorian uh, season two with uh, the, the you hear the bone crunching as they're. You know, as he's weave, we, wielding his stick. They, they're great with the sound effects in this show, man. There's a lot of bone crunching and uh, mm -hmm. flesh tearing sounds. Yeah, they're having fun at Skywalker Sound. For sure. If he had spoken such insolence to Java, he'd have fed you to his menagerie. His menagerie. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, this is where he says, well, what, why are we listening to you? What, what if we just kill you and, and take over ourselves? And Fennec Shan says, well, if, if you'd have said that to Jabba, he would have already uh, taken care of you by now. You know, this guy's hearing you out. We'll see how far this gets him. I mean, he's trying to be, you know, the adult in the room. But, you know, guys like this, um, they understand one thing, brute force. But he's yeah. trying to be like a, maybe a little more level headed. He's, and, he's, uh, a, he's a pro progressive gangster. Yeah. You know, he's an all inclusive gangster. <laughs> I mean, we'll see how well that goes for him yeah more Klaatuinians speak freely and that's it that is it gets us excited just to see the very first footage from the show but um, you know in the history of Star Wars trailers I don't think this one ranks very high <laughs> um, again no. it's just nice to see the fresh look of the character and yep. but I mean we don't even get any indication as to like any other Actors who may be in the show. Uh, other well, with one exception, we, though. With, with one, one exception, exception yeah. Yes. We, we get one one reveal. One reveal, and uh, man, if you grew up in the in the eighties, uh, you know uh, Jennifer Beals, uh, made most famous by uh, her turn in um, Flashdance. Uh, so she looked she looked like this. Uh, if you remember that, oh yeah. And and this is her as a Twi'lek in uh, in Mandalorian. Now she's hot off of uh, the what is it? The L word. I think that was the or a spinoff of the L word. One of those shows. Um, yeah, yeah. The I, L word. I, I yeah. Generation know, I, Q. I, 
I really only know her. Uh, she's a Chicago actress, and I really only know her from her big breakthrough in Flashdance. Yeah. She's had a career that's been pretty steady and strong since the 80s. She looks great and fantastic as a Twi'lek. Oh, she sure does. And, uh, it, it's, it's nice to have another familiar name in the cast roster for the Mandalorian, which is now a roster of three names. <laughs> as far as we know, we <laughs> right. have Tim Morrison, we have well, now when, and now we have Jennifer Beals. This is a, just a little bit of a problem that I, that I have. And, and I, this whole thing of secrecy in star Wars kind of drives me a little nutty because I yeah. feel like ever since the, I am your father moment was, was blown by Dave Prowse, wherever the story goes, that, that Star Wars has been just synonymous, practically reinvented, you know, on set secrecy. And I, I mean, I get it. You don't want to be, there's a difference between being spoiled and, and getting excited and getting something to, to really get you excited. I think about that first trailer, Jim, for The Phantom Menace after Star Wars had been away for so long. They gave us a lot in that trailer. They gave us some great dialogue by Qui-Gon Jinn. You believe it's this boy. I mean, you really got a sense of what it was about. And they gave you a sense of how, of scale, of how big a picture this was going to be, especially with the Gungans coming over the, the, um, uh, the landscape there, uh, the horizon, mm. This huge, this just doesn't feel that it doesn't feel epic. And I understand, you know, that Mando, it, it, it took some time, but, um, I just feel that they really should have given us more here. Uh, they gave us very, very little, nothing in terms of, of plot that we wouldn't have just sort of guessed. There were no surprises in this. No. Kind of a letdown, honestly. It doesn't make yeah, me any it, more excited. I'm a fan. I'm super excited right, for the show. Right. It's 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 not uh, the most spectacular trailer we've ever seen. Uh, before the show, Jason, you said, and I think this is the most appropriate comment to say about it, is it felt like a teaser for next week's episode. Next oh, yeah, week right. The, 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 you know, like you'd <laughs> right. see a, a promo for them. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't feel like a big, grand, epic trailer. Right. It feels like... Very, very small, very small, very yeah. tight. And um and and doesn't give us too many hints or teases about what the series is gonna be about, outside of the fact that Boba Fett has taken over Job of the Hutt's crime family. Mm -hmm. You know, you are Bib Fortuna who, who <laughs> took it over from Jabba and then, you know. Um, and and he's using that position to try to unite all the other criminal factions yeah, to come together under his rule. And I mean, so something kind of similar to what we saw Darth Maul do in the Clone Wars mm -hmm. when he was trying to unite everyone under the banner of the Shadow Collective. And uh, so Boba is uh, apparently trying to do something very similar. Um, this attempt um, to make him a more like benevolent and understanding yeah. ru ruler. I, that part I don't really get. And I, I, I'm looking forward to that getting fleshed out a little bit more for me. I just don't know if Disney is comfortable taking the anti-hero and uh, running with him as a protagonist in the yep. series. Anti-hero, that's to, the word. I think that's what we would like yeah. to see. But yeah, instead, that's they're trying to turn him into some sort of Boy Scout. Or just some sort of inspirational leader. Which yeah. could work. I mean, this this all could just work, you know. Um, but I, I hope that they don't abandon the core of the character because we've seen in the Disney era of Star Wars that they are talented when it comes to abandoning the core of a character. <laughs> and yeah. Um, yeah, and I just figured that Boba Fett's next on the list. Um, however. The backbone for this show has been established in season two of The Mandalorian. And I say that's a really solid foundation to build upon. And that gives me a lot of faith and hope in this show. It appears we'll be getting a lot of Tatooine action, um, which is, uh, you know, I mean, it's Tatooine. It, I'd like to see the show spread its wings 
and go elsewhere in the galaxy because we're coming up on a Kenobi series that's going to be Tatooine focused, I'm sure. Yep. For for at least a large percentage of it. And uh, I, I want to see something fresh from the Boba Fett series. And judging by this trailer alone, it doesn't look like it's going to be really going outside the box. It, it, it just appears to be very straightforward. And um, I think I'm expecting something a little more epic, especially after the Mandalorian. Mandalorian felt a little more epic. It felt small at times. Yeah. But it all went somewhere. Yes. Sure oh, was- yes. And listen. We can't forget, you know, Robert Rodriguez having all the confidence in the world to say that this show will not disappoint. We've heard Tamor Morrison also uh, insinuate that uh, the quality of the show is totally up to par. So we've, we've heard some of are, our friends say that it's mm-hmm, going to yeah, blow yeah. us away. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. we have uh, no reason to believe, but I, I just think that um, they take the secrecy thing too far. Just too far, you know, and, and, and Dave Floney would say to us, uh, you know, well, we don't want to show that because then the fans, they get their hopes up and their expectations. Well, that's what the trailer's for. Let me get my <laughs> hopes up and let me get my expectations, you know? So you show me a character and I go, oh, wow. So-and-so's in it. And then he's only in it for like a minute yeah. and a half. Yeah. Okay. I'll survive. I'll live. It's almost a fear of showing us something with the knowledge that, it's not going to be as good as you think it's going right. to be. That's right. You know, That's sure, right. we're showing you a Bomar monk right now, but uh, don't expect really more than that. It's not yeah. going to come to play. I'm, I'm just using it as an example. Right, right. And right, the secrecy right. thing is a little inconsistent, too, because um, they announced Hayden Christensen's going to be in the Kenobi series. Yeah, right. But they've wanted to sit on that a little bit. And surprise tells me that he tells me that he's going to be in it a lot if they're going yeah, out with that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, that's something that they did not keep under wraps at all. No. But if you ask, you know, is Bosk going to be in an episode this season? It's like, oh my god, if we, knew that, <laughs> we would have to kill you if we told. We can't. Uh, that. We, yo, you can't handle that. That nugget. No. Bosk. No. So yeah, yeah. So it's it's funny. It's funny. It's a game. It's a game. Mm-hmm. I think partially uh, Lucasfilm likes to troll the fan base a little bit. They love to wield the power over us. Yeah. And watch us, you know, yeah. squirm. They love to watch us squirm. <laughs> but uh, you know, I just don't see it kids. as much with other other franchises. They're not they're not afraid. In fact, sometimes the criticism, you know, some of these other franchises go, Hey, you showed me the whole movie in this trailer. Yeah, right. You know? Right. Well, that's an issue. That's a problem. I don't. Yeah, want you don't that. want that. You don't want that, right? Hey, by the way, like this that. is that concept art that uh, Paul had sent over. This is the Doug Chang stuff. So, this does look a lot like what that city is we were talking about, where it's in the in the canyon, and doesn't doesn't say Tatooine to me. I think this is not Tatooine. Well, these designs that Chang illustrated are definitely intended to be Tatooine but not what but, but I don't think what we saw in the in the Mandalorian show is necessary necessarily right. Tatooine and that that's quite possible I mean you know um when I think back to uh, Star Wars Rebels so much Ralph McQuarrie concept art was repurposed for that show and it was used in in different methods than intended to be used by the original concept art. Um, some of the topography for the planet Lothal was based on Macquarie concept art for the planet Alderaan. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. Th- you know, things can be shifted and moved around a little bit on the playing board. Yeah. Just depending on how well it fits the story. And weren't those ice spiders supposed to be on Hoth? On Dagobah. Oh, they were supposed to be on Dagobah. That's right. And they weren't ice yes. spiders there. They were swamp spiders. No, no, no. They were making those in those little egg mounds and all that yeah, stuff. Yeah, that was yeah. supposed to be Dagobah. But it appeared in the Mandalorian season two then on that ice planet with the hot spa for frog lady. Oh, that's right. The yeah. hot springs. Hot yeah. spring. Hey, before we uh, wrap up our chat about uh, all things Boba Fett and Mandalorian, uh, Jim, you had mentioned earlier at the top of the show, Giancarlo Esposito, he's uh, uh, always a fan favorite when he hits the convention circuit. And he was recently at Fan Expo Denver 
And the question to him, I believe, was, uh, well, I think the question's in the video, but um, something about who was your favorite, who did you really enjoy uh, working with? And here's what he had to say. Um, in The Mandalorian, who was your favorite coast worker to work with? My goodness, in case you were asking me for one. Um, yeah, I have to say, and, and this may be, um, well, okay, I'll say it without hesitation. Um, Gina Corral. Any of that, in particular, other than uh, any of her political beliefs or what she said, whether I think it's inappropriate or appropriate or not, right? We as actors, yeah, we probably sometimes, I know for me, I should just shut my mouth, but sometimes I can't. And I've got to say what I believe because it has to go on record. I love working with her. She's warm and beautiful and wonderful. And, you know, I don't care what her politics are. Uh, I love the fact that, that she came to acting late and that she was so raw and original and beautiful, um, and I just think she's a lovely person. So I, I shout her out and I say, um, she's one of my favorites. Second favorite. No, we don't care about your second favorite. Oh, uh, well, no. You just gonna say Baby Yoda anyway. Oh, of course. Uh, that's my guess. That's my guess. But it, it was kind of hard to hear that audio. It was recorded from the audience by somebody on a smartphone. But he was saying that his favorite character, uh, his favorite actor to work with was Gina Carano. He didn't. He doesn't care what her politics are. She's a wonderful person on the set and a damn good actress and fits the role really well. Yeah. And I think that's the only criteria that should be looked at as far as Gina goes. But she um, she uh, got under the skin of uh, some of the wrong people within uh, corporate Lucasfilm and mm. Disney. And, and so that's, that's yeah. pretty strong, though, for Giancarlo to go oh. out there on stage and just really, you know, kind of crap all over their decision to fire her. Yeah. And it might even fuel the rumor mill a little bit because John Carlo never says, uh, refers to Gina in the past tense. Right. He uh, speaks of her uh, still in the present tense. And uh, that could be something that we could be looking at between the lines. You know, we like to do that here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so that could be quite telling because there have been rumors out there that Cara Dune is going to be in season three or season four of the Mandalorian. So I, I don't know. I say yeah. take, take those rumors with a grain of salt for sure. But, but uh, the fact that he's still out there, I mean, it would have been so easy Jim, for Giancarlo to, I mean, think of all the different co-stars that he has his hat on this show. It's been so mm -hmm. easy for him to pick someone else. That was a choice. And yeah. I'm not saying that he he's he's uh, flattering her unnecessarily. I think that I think it was a choice for him to, to to speak his truth in that moment. And his truth in that moment is the person that he really enjoyed hanging out with and being on the set the most with was Gina Carano. And yeah. that's pretty consistent with other people. We were talking on before the show. Bill Burr said something very similar about how much he enjoyed being with uh, Gina. Carl Weathers. Carl Weathers, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he's, he's publicly spoken in support of her. Um, yeah, yeah, really yeah. interesting. John Carlo Esposito, he's not a guy to BS. Right. And uh, he's a straight shooter. So uh, I, I believe that he is uh, speaking from the heart when he endorses her like that. I agree. And uh, we'll just have to wait and see. But uh, for all for all intents and purposes, Gina Carano is no longer working on any Lucasfilm projects. And uh, there's really been no official indication that that has changed at all. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, speaking of uh, shelved Star Wars uh, <laughs> people, actors, projects. Uh, we did get this in from Tim Stott. Tim uh, contacted us through our website at rebelforceradio.com. He says, uh, hey, Jimmy, uh, longtime listener, love the show. Hey, Jimmy, I work here too. Yeah. Anyway, wanted to let you know that Seth Green talks a little bit about Star Wars detours and his relationship with Star Wars on the most recent Lights, Camera, Barstool podcast. Hope you enjoy. So, Jim, you went through and pulled a couple of clips for us. Yeah, yeah, it's a um, little bit of new insight into detours. Uh, we know Seth has gone on the record a couple of times over the last few years talking about why it hasn't been released, what is 
keeping it from going out there for people to see. And uh, Seth discusses that here a little bit on uh, the Barstool podcast. It's an interesting lesson in, in producing content, which is something that anybody that's ever produced content learns, which is that there's a, a definite reality to things being made and never being exhibited. Um, some of this, I think, is more about the way in which it could be distributed and the fact that Lucasfilm has a, a clear mandate of the content they're going to release under the banner and that this because it predates any of that evolution or decision-making or the Disney acquisition or the Disney plus being a platform, it isn't the content they want to put out under that banner. Yeah. Yeah. They just, it's not their thing. <laughs> it's yeah. Not anything their thing. created by George Lucas, they, they don't want anything to do with. And they made that clear when they rejected his sequel ideas, forcing George to walk away from it all. And Star, Star Wars Detours was something he was working on there at the uh, mm -hmm. very end mm -hmm. when the company was sold. Uh, they don't want to have anything to do with that. They canceled the Clone Wars. They canceled Star Wars 1313 and disbanded LucasArts as a video game producer. They also disbanded largely most of the Lucasfilm animation. Just keeping right. a, few, a few of the leadership on board. Notably Dave and, Filoni. Uh, yeah, yeah, Filoni and some of his hand-picked guys. Yeah, but uh, yeah, D Disney has made it absolutely clear they want nothing to do with the George Lucas era of Star Wars. They want to remold, rebrand, and reboot the entire franchise per their discretion, and uh, they own the company. So yeah, they bought the IP. They can do whatever it is. <laughs> they can do whatever they want. They don't have to listen to the fans. I think that there is. Thanks to Dave Filoni and John Favreau and others, I think there is a contingent inside the company that is yes. continuing to make sure that the because they themselves are fans, they want what the, the what the fans desire. Yeah. And they also yeah. know at the end of the day that's what's going to make it work. You can't you cannot <laughs> chase away the fans of a franchise like that and it, it, and expect to replace them all with new fans. It's never happened. It's never happened. In fact, we have enough evidence that it's nearly impossible. You can't reboot something and tick off and isolate the, 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 the foundation. You just can't. That's right. Create that's, something that's new wonderful. if that's what you want to do. Totally true. Totally true. Yeah. Yeah, create something new. <laughs> sure. Why create something new when you can buy so much? You know what I love? I love when when new stuff comes out and when the old fans say, I don't know, it just didn't quite do it for me. The, the new fans go, yeah, but the original was crap too. Ooh, I, you, don't you love that excuse? Like, yeah. I don't know, the dialogue was really, yeah, but the dialogue sucked in the original. This sucks less. <laughs> 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 they just got to tear oh. down the original to make the new stuff better. Uh, yeah, it's generational angst in fandom. <laughs> Always a hoot. Yeah. Uh, we have more detours talk from Seth Green. Yes. Um, he talks a little bit about the leaks that occurred earlier this year, or I yeah. should say late last year, how that kind of uh, affects things and, and how uh, detours was something that might have been created for a different time, a different era. Uh. We um, set out to make a Simpsons in the Star Wars universe. That's exactly what we did. And it's, it's broken up into those um, pieces, uh, some of which leaked. And nobody likes that, honestly, because <laughs> for real, the, the legalities of co content and IP protection at, at Lucasfilm, it's so serious. Like, I've been made aware of how... Uh, big and insistent that apparatus is so the fact that something leaked like nobody likes that because there's so few people that have access to any of that material in perpetuity let alone at the time the fact that anything got out from any point nobody likes that we made something we we really dug and we still dig and um uh, put a lot of effort in but it also isn't <laughs> it's something that was <clears throat> that was derived at that moment a moment when there wasn't a plan to make new movies, a moment when there wasn't a plan to um, uh, 
in, uh, introduce this content to a different generation um, with ongoing narrative storytelling. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was um, very much of its time. And he, he brings up a good point. I mean, we as fans, we want to see everything. Um, and I think it would have its place, at least in terms of diehard fans that would appreciate and enjoy it for what it is. But to release it commercially and on a big platform and make a lot of hay over it, probably not the best idea. Right. At this and, phase. And perhaps some of the content is seriously dated at this point. Oh, it have to be. It have would, to be. You know, the comedy could be going over everyone's heads. Well, or, you know, people like us would be like, oh, I remember that. <laughs> Well, it's funny to hear reference to that. You know? Not right, not just the references, but the humor itself may be considered inappropriate now or Ooh, offensive well, of now. That that might be That's closer to guarantee. the truth. <laughs> That's a guarantee. And uh, so you know, oh well, detours. Yeah, I actually was having a, a little bit of um, optimism about it coming out, especially after. They posted up the Ewok movies and the right. Clone Wars micro series mm-hmm. and the droids and Ewoks animated stuff. And, and they fart out those Lego specials like crazy. <laughs> and that stuff's totally ir- irreverent and silly and stupid. Um, so I can't see how you want to say, well, we're trying to introduce a whole new generation of Star Wars and we don't want to confuse them with uh, parody and silliness and stuff when those Lego specials are coming out by the handful every year. Mm. Uh, I, and and I, I don't see anything in detours that tells me that uh, it's any more or less highbrow than those Lego specials. So. Yeah. Yeah. I, I almost get the sense that Lego has a very unique agreement with, right. with Lucasfilm. I've always uh, thought that too. Yeah. Yeah. It's unlike any of the other licensees mm-hmm. and, um, and, and it, it works. It works. I love the video games. The specials are good. I think I don't think they're as quite as good as the uh, the first ones that came out. I think um, they've maybe lost the edge just a little bit. Um, but I think they're going for more of a more of a kid friendly audience more than, than they are sort of the uh, you know the older fan. Absolutely. There's no question about that. I mean, we just saw the terrifying tales. Yeah, but if you compare that to the like the Yoda Chronicles, one of those first uh, specials that came out, um, it's good. It's good. I enjoyed it, but it didn't. There's some really laugh out loud funny moments in the in the Yoda Chronicles, and um, the proof's in the pudding. I mean, my son he loves the Yoda Chronicles, and I sat down to watch the um, the the Halloween special and the Christmas special last year, and yeah, just kind of, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Where's he stand on the Freemaker adventures? Yeah, you know he hasn't seen any of those. I should, uh, I should watch those with him because. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. But th- those were a lot closer to those original Lego specials several years ago. But anyway, so there it is. Detours likely to not see uh, the light of day, and if it, and if the, and if you do, I think it's going to be. Like you said, Jim, you compared it to when they released Clone Wars micro series and droids and Ewoks. It's just kind of like, hey, this, you know, you're going to see it on Jedi News. <laughs> you're not going to see it in, you know, Deadline or Hollywood Reporter. Uh, Variety. Got really, yeah, page. exactly. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Uh, I think sooner or later they'll get released. I don't know. Or at least we'll get a bootleg, you know. Yeah, you Seth get it at the conventions. That <laughs> Seth Green did say, you know, so few people had access to the content when they were creating it. And uh-huh. even less nowadays, Yeah, people over there who can get into well, it. Well, don't we know that it was weird out? I mean, is that, that's not proven, is it? No, it's just, there's it's a few roads lead to weird. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but I mean, why would they be giving him any sort of content on his home computer to begin with? I, I just, I don't know. Cause he's weird out. Because he's weird Al. Yeah. And somebody else wanted to be his weird pal. So they gave him access. You, you never give somebody access who goes by weird anything. Yeah. Who would have thought he'd leak it? I mean, I mean, his yeah, name is it's not it's not like it's respectable, Al. 
you know, by the book, Al. <laughs> yeah. Oh, all right. Hey, let's do this uh, follow up here real quick on Spirit of Qui Gon. Qui Gon. Oh yeah, sure you know. Uh, last week was our our, our Halloween episode, um, and as the force would have it, we we talked a lot about force ghosts. You know, uh, which force ghosts we see, the 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 restraint that it seems that um, has befallen uh, Lucasfilm and using force ghosts, and um, we started talking about the uh, the cut scene of Yoda communing with Qui Gon. At the end of Revenge of the Sith, and we were chatting about, well, was that ever filmed? No, it was never filmed. Did they record the voiceover for it? Did Liam Neeson record? No, he didn't even, re even record the voiceover. And I'm like, but I feel like I've heard it. I feel like I've heard it. And Jim mentioned last week, well, it's 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 in the novelization and it's in the audio book. And of course, that's why I feel like it was in a deleted scene, but it w actually wasn't. Yeah, yeah. It, it's one of those... Uh yeah, I saw the big dark lighter scenes in the original Star Wars. No, you didn't. Nobody. It's ever just saw like that. I saw Yoda talking to Liam Neeson at the end I of Revenge did. of the Sith. I yeah. know I did. I swear, but no, it, it didn't happen. But it was presented in a few different mediums, like um, like the audio book and the novelization and stuff. But I just wanted to sort of walk through the spirit of Qui Gon. And his appearances in Star Wars. Mm -hmm. And the first time we get any indication of the spirit of Qui-Gon is in Attack of the Clones. When Yoda is meditating and he hears Qui-Gon's voice oh, yeah. just briefly. Anakin! Anakin! No! I always wondered about the no. <laughs> it doesn't sound anything like Liam Neeson. It sounds more like Matthew Wood. Uh, oh, by the way, I did send Matt an email asking him about the origin of the EOP fart uh -huh. that we were talking about last week, and he never responded. Oh, okay. All right. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll wait. He's gotten in trouble for talking to us in the past, Yeah. and uh, so once bitten, twice shy. That's all he needs is uh, yeah, him that's all talking to Rebel Force Radio about EOP farts. Right. Yeah. Right. And, and he accidentally drops information about the next trilogy, you know, <laughs> something like that would happen. Yeah. If you guys and think these farts are good, wait till you see the one in episode 10. That, that's real. <laughs> I'm, oh, I'm mixing that one down. Oh, it's such amazing <laughs> sound design. You'll be smelling that fart in the theater. <laughs> All right. So yeah, Anakin, Anakin. No. All right. Here's something that I sound like Qui-Gon Jinn and say no. No. And it's recycled, uh, audio um i don't know about the no part but the anakin anakin is is, it, recycled. is it is it's from uh the phantom menace when darth maul is riding his speeder bike yeah. chasing anakin and qui-gon is he tells him to drop approaching. drop drop yeah um i don't you know what i don't like about this i think it's very uncharacteristic of a jedi spirit he's awfully hysterical I mean, look at look at old Ben when he's trying to convince Luke to not leave Dagobah. Luke, I don't want to lose you the way I lost Vader. Like he, um, he he never really gets carried away. I mean, he's imploring, but he's not like, no, Luke, Luke, you can't go. No, it's just a little over the top, and I it just un, I don't know. I just can't imagine a Force ghost once you've transcended and you know the secrets of the universe and you know uh, uh mortality and reality and all of that i just think you'd probably be a little more zen you just chill all the time yeah. oh, once you're dead Anakin. once you're dead you're the most relaxed you'd ever been <laughs> um Anakin. in my canon no. that's not qui-gon <laughs> yelling no that is um a midi chlorian who is entered into the vision that Yoda's having. Oh, um, just and, a random midi chlorine? Yeah, just a ran, just random. He's just uh -huh. watching. Yeah. You know, and he's just watching and he yells, no. Hmm. Um, that no is really weird. It's hmm. really, really weird. And it's definitely not Liam Neeson. No. Because that's about the best you get out of him. Yeah. Like, no. Wait, wait. I Let me try again, George. 
Oh, yeah, here we go. No, no, no. I, 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 George, I had way too many Marlboros this morning. <laughs> no, no. I, I can't do it. Can you have one of your sound guys maybe drop in the no part? I have wood do it. Anakin. See, I, I love that. The, Anakin, Anakin, no. I, I, <laughs> George. Uh, that's George, it right there. Gotta... You just did it. That's it. Oh, yeah, sure. You know, George, you could put this shit on paper, but you can't say it. <laughs> that's what Harrison said. He told All me right, that so... when I got the gig. <laughs> Dear Liam. All right, Neeson, out. All right. So then when do we see or hear the ghost of Kwai John again? Well, we don't. Not in the film. Yeah. Not in any film. Right. That's the only time we actually ever get exposed to the spirit of Qui-Gon via cinema. Mm-hmm. But in the in the uh, Revenge of the Sith audiobook, there is that sequence where Yoda is communicating with the spirit of Qui-Gon Jinn. Mm. And it was something that Lucas wanted to include in the final script, but he just ended up dropping it. And yeah. there, there could be practical reasons like the lack of availability of Liam Neeson to come in and record the lines because he was in a motorcycle accident, or it could just be, it was an idea that George didn't feel like telegraphing at that yeah. time. So the only place to really find it is in the novelization written by Matthew Stover. And we have the audiobook excerpt narrated by Jonathan Davis. Now I just took the dialogue. So you won't hear any of the narration. This is just dialogue only of how that scene would have gone down a little bit if it ended up in the final film. An infinite mystery is the force. Much to learn, there still is. And you will have time to learn it. Infinite knowledge, infinite time does that require. With my help, you can learn to join with the force, yet retain consciousness. You can join your light to it forever, perhaps in time, even your physical self. Eternal life. The ultimate goal of the Sith, yet they can never achieve it. It comes only by the release of self, not the exaltation of self. It comes through compassion, not greed. Love is the answer to the darkness. Become one with the Force, yet influence still to have a power greater than all it is. It cannot be granted. It can only be taught. It is yours to learn if you wish it. A very great Jedi Master you have become, Qui-Gon Jinn. A very great Jedi Master you always were, but too blind I was to see it. Your apprentice, I gratefully become. Oh, I pledge myself to your teachings. Uh, Master. Yeah, so it's a long scene. I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of talking in that. I mean, it's a it's it's also a kind of a I don't you know, not to beat this drum, but I I take a lot of ribbing from fans, even even from you, Jim, uh about I just am not a big fan of Star Wars novels. I just and and that scene is a really good example. George could have written that scene, that same scene, in a third of the time, and it would have been just as impactful and just as powerful. But it just goes on and on and on. Yeah, we get it. We get it. It's too much. Well, yeah. I I, I think he, he thought it was best just to leave it. A little bit uh, up to you to sort of uh, identify what was going on there in that scene. Yoda says it all to Obi Wan. He says, yeah. "I'll teach you how to communicate with uh, with Qui Gon," and uh, he does. And um, I, I think we'll be seeing evidence of this in the Kenobi series. Yes, I yes. really do. I, I mean, really all do. you this need is like- love. Thing is a little is a little. Cornball too. All you need is love. Yeah. Yes. What what, what is the joke? Uh, how how Yoda sings it? All you need is love. All you need is love. All he you sing, need he is sings love. love. Love is, is all, all you need. need. <laughs> he, he, then Yoda sings that <laughs> right. last line. Yeah. That's right. He, he was actually in the Beatles. 
for uh, uh, two weeks. Uh, well, you and, know, and Jonathan uh, Davis is great, but boy, uh, I was just sitting there thinking of Tom Kane. Like I was hearing Tom Kane Yoda in my head in place of uh, Jonathan Davis. Ooh, well, we have uh, we have some examples of Tom Kane in his fine work because uh, we do have some uh, clips of Yoda communicating with the spirit of Qui Gon from season Ooh. six of the Clone Wars. But before we go there, I, I want to kind of go in order here. All righty, uh, because the next time. We get exposed to the spirit of Qui-Gon, at least as far as Star Wars history goes. Now, I'm not talking about the timeline. I'm talking about historically. Um, we get reintroduced to the spirit of Qui-Gon on Mortis in season three of the Clone Wars. The spirit of Qui-Gon appears to both Anakin and Obi-Wan. But I just want to focus in on the Obi-Wan mm -hmm. encounter that he has with the spirit because uh, Qui-Gon sort of explains to Obi-Wan how it's possible for him to be seeing a vision of his old master. Obi-Wan, have you done as I asked? Have you trained the boy? Master Qui-Gon, how are you here? I am here because you are here. No, I, I don't understand. What is this place? Unlike any other, a conduit through which the entire force of the universe flows. Are we in danger? This planet is both an amplifier and a magnet. Three are here who seek Skywalker. They, like me, believe him to be the Chosen One. You were right. The force within him is stronger than any known Jedi. I've trained him as well as I could, but he's still willful and balance eludes him. If he is the Chosen One, he will discover it here. And if not? Then you must realize with his power, this is a very dangerous place for him to be. Well, I remember that like it was yesterday, that episode. It mm. was just am amazing. Yes. Um, something we never thought we'd see. Well, yeah. I mean, it, it was hard to believe that they actually were able to recruit Liam Neeson, who's at that time especially was one of the most busy actors in hollywood yeah uh you know he was making he was all those constantly. crime movies yeah yeah, yeah. vigilante or something yeah, you know yeah. somebody, uh, seeking revenge you know yeah. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so uh they were able to pull him away from that to uh work on star wars again and uh he was all for it so uh i think that was great that we got him back and um it's really interesting that he explains you know Mortis made it possible. Mortis made it possible. Yes. And, right. and the presence of Obi-Wan Kenobi on Mortis makes it possible. Now, of course, Mortis, is it a place? Was it a vision? All of that stuff is really still up in the air. But uh, I think that that is how they were able to have these visions without the proper training. Because Obi-Wan has to train to be able to communicate with Qui-Gon. Yoda had to train in order to communicate with Qui-Gon. And he learned from these Force priestesses in Season 6 of The Clone Wars how to achieve that, to be able to communicate with Qui-Gon like, uh, regularly and to achieve everlasting life himself. So let's jump over to season six of the Clone Wars. Yoda started hearing the voice of Qui-Gon while he was meditating. And then he induced a vision by placing himself in a Bacta tank. And he had a vision uh, that took him to Dagobah, of all places. And uh, the spirit of Qui-Gon was his guide oh. on Dagobah. And takes him to the dark side tree and all of this stuff. But here we have a little clip for, of that uh, Force Vision encounter. Yoda, my old friend, you have come at last. Cry Ganji, really you? It is? It is. Losing my mind, I am not? No, my friend, no. Strong this planet is with the Force. It is one of the purest places in the galaxy. How are you here? I am a manifestation of the Force. A Force that consists of two parts. 
Living beings generate the living force, which in turn powers the wellspring that is the cosmic force. Show yourself. Can you? I cannot. My training was incomplete. All energy from the living force, from all things that have ever lived, feeds into the cosmic force, binding everything and communicating to us through the midichlorians. Because of this, I can speak to you now. See the future. You can. I exist where there is no future or past. Your path is clear, Yoda. You have been chosen, as I was before you. For what chosen am I? You will learn to preserve your life force, and so manifest a consciousness which will allow you to commune with the living after death. How? Dark times are ahead, and forces of light must remain. This is the path of only a few Jedi. You will travel to one of the origins of all life in the galaxy. This place is where? The Force will be your guide. Mm. And off he goes. And that's how he then learned to encounter the priestesses. But um, it's kind of a trip to know that certain individuals strong with the Force are being singled out. And that's that whole destiny coming into play again in Star Wars. You know, you can't yeah. escape your destiny. Right. And that's because certain individuals get chosen by uh, by the cosmic forces in the universe to uh, achieve certain abilities or, uh, or higher levels of consciousness. Mm. Obviously, mm. Obi-Wan is in that club. He'd have to be. Yeah. And He'd Anakin. Yep, yep. And uh, Luke, for that matter. And Luke Leia. and Leia, right, right. And so it's all in the family. Mm. Um, at one point, Qui-Gon tells Yoda that he was trained by a shaman of the wills. And that line comes from a book, the Revenge of the Sith illustrated screenplay. So it was obviously something that George had slid into the script for Revenge of the Sith. And the line was, the ability to defy oblivion can be achieved. Oh, wait. I'm going to do this. as quite gone. I'm sorry. Mm, all right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Cosmic force. You got any Marlboros around me? Here we go. The ability to defy oblivion can be achieved, but only for oneself. It was accomplished by a shaman of the wills. It is a state acquired through compassion, not greed. All right. Well, that's really good. That's really it's good. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> I've done better. I've done better. I'm not feeling. I did do my my Qui Gon, my my Qui John warm up. I didn't do that. Oh. Oh, yeah, sure. All right. Uh, so the ability to defy oblivion can be achieved. It was accomplished by a shaman of the wills. It is a state acquired through compassion, not greed. And that's a little bit more of a George Lucas way of putting it as opposed to the, you know, all you need is love. Yeah, rap, right. That Matthew Stover applied to Kwai John. Mm -hmm. um, and I call him Kwai John because that's what Liam Neeson calls him. Yeah. So it's canon. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, right. You can't contradict Liam Neeson. He is Kwai John. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've also noticed oh. uh, if you go back, if you hear a George talking about Kwai Gon, he calls him Kwai Gon. He really emphasizes Qui -Gon. the gun. You know, Qui Gon. Kwai Gon. Kwai Gon. Kwai -Gon. Yeah, I'll tell you, you'll like it. Kwai Gon. <laughs> huh. Where I always we say, do. I always say Qui Gon, Qui Gon Jin, or Qui Gon yeah, Jin. You put the on the Qui, right, right, right. or the Jin. Yeah. George is Qui like right. Jin, Qui Gon, whatever. <laughs> I think he does that just to mess with us. <laughs> he deliberately. I, I came up like, with the name when I was riding my zebra. What do you want from me, <laughs> Qui John? <laughs> Before I ate it, <laughs> <laughs> that was delicious. <laughs> 
Uh, but, yeah, right. George actually yeah. he dropped the whole idea of the wills eventually. It, it, it never really came into play. His idea for the wills was that it was a uh, an, an, a higher being, like an immortal, mm. that was watching and recording the entire Star Wars story, like a historian. Oh. Um, Oh, wiser yeah, than right, yeah. wiser than the people that are in the story and is observing. Right, know? right, right, right. And then he just dropped the whole idea and, and just boiled it all down to the force itself. But he stuck with the Journal of the Wills as the name of his notebook. And that's all it was. It was just George's nickname for his notebook. His it wasn't doodles. an actual fleshed out story. <laughs> it, it beats calling it his doodles. He was going to return to the idea in the sequel trilogy. Uh huh. They didn't want he any part of that. It's on the wills. Um, microscopic. What did he say? Uh, microscopic. It happens uh, on a beings. on a microcosmic and, level. Yeah, yeah. He says something <laughs> like. That. But then uh, Bob Iger kicked that idea to the curb. Thought it was probably George. How is it going to hold a lightsaber if it's uh, if, if it's if it's a uh, uh, an amoeba? Yeah, yeah, but see, that's that wasn't the point of it. right. I, of course, see that it was just going to be an underlying theme. Yeah, instead of, uh, of the instead entire... of three D glasses, you have to get a microscope to watch the yeah. movie. You're going to watch it all under a microscope. Yeah, suck on that, Cameron. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what do you say? Well, you want to do a little Star Wars and pop culture, or yeah, some listener feedback? That. What do you want to do? Let's do the pop culture. Let's do the pop culture. All right. Let's see what's going on. Here. Rebel Force Radio. You've already made that Star Wars reference. Your source for the Force. Star Wars parody. <laughs> 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 All right. Got an email from Bryce. Bryce, uh, he actually sent an email along with the actual clip from the film where this pop culture reference Ooh. is found. The film is F9. The ninth installment of the Fast and Furious franchise, oh, yep, F9. Yep, yep. Which was um, probably the biggest box office release worldwide since the pandemic. I uh, Probably up until the Bond film. I believe the two of them are kind of uh, sharing those, uh, the, the King of the Hill status for yeah. best box well, And then, then there's that Carnage movie. Venom. Venom. That's right. Yeah, Venom, not yeah. Carnage. He's the other one. That, but I feel like that's b bigger than Bond. Um, I don't know. Maybe not. Maybe domestically, but not internationally. Yeah, probably not internationally. But So you have uh, F9. There's a couple of Star Wars references. I heard some people mentioning this recently, but I didn't know what the actual references were until our buddy Bryce sent us the email with the references attached. So uh, there's a couple of them. Here's one. It sounds like uh, the bad guy is giving a pep talk to his minions before they carry out some evil doings. Okay, listen up. I want 50 of the best men. I want guns. I want wheels. Freaking X Wing fighters. I don't care. The Millennium Falcon Chewbacca, if you can get a hold of him. One is no object. Go. Go! <laughs> Chewbacca, oh! if you can get a hold of him. If you can get a hold of him, <laughs> we will hire Chewbacca. Money is not an issue. Somebody should have checked out me in my chewy jacket. Oh, that'd have been weekend. great. Could, that'd have been perfect. I could I could drive a car really fast and really furious. I mean, there are so many actors in those F, you know, Fast and Furious movies. I, not out of the realm of possibility. You get a little uh, Chewbacca showing up in one. Why not? Why not? We need more crossovers. Yes. Star Wars crossing over into for Fast it. and Furious. That's a piece of cake. I'd love to see it. <laughs> the only time we ever saw Star Wars crossover in another film was with the uh, Night in the Museum 2, where Darth Vader appeared in the museum. Oh, Indian in the cupboard. Oh, the action figures. The action figure came to life, but it was, uh, you know, it, it, yeah. it, it looked like a movie version of vader but yeah i forgot about that night at the museum that's right yeah vintage star wars action figures were featured in the uh poltergeist yep uh, they they were new they weren't vintage back then yeah they were new um but I, i'm talking about like actual characters crossing over sure yeah 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 yeah, yeah. I, I mean vader doesn't really happen much 
Darth Vader was meant to be taken literally as the Darth Vader in A Night at the Museum too. Oh, really? So, oh yeah, it's canon. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> there's more in uh, F9. Uh-huh. After that, after the bad guy gives his pep talk, then um, his girl uh, comes over and uh, gives him uh, the opposite of a pep talk, it seems. Oh, pep, uh, not so pep talk. Pep talk. If this was a movie, this would be the moment where the villain has an unexpected setback, overcompensates without thinking it through, and gets crushed by the good guys. No offense, but you have no idea what we're about to do. And for the record, we are the good guys. Me, I'm Luke freaking Skywalker. Are you sure about that? I mean, I get the daddy issues, but... (laughs) Really? Luke? You're right. No, I'm more of a Han Solo. No. You're Yoda. Yoda? Mm Mm-hmm. Nah, the little green guy. Nah. (laughs) Ah, shit, I'll take it. Because he's a powerful Jedi, right? No. Yoda's a puppet. With someone's hand up his ass. Oh, Oh, there's the payoff. There's the payoff. These movies are terrible, aren't they? I mean, they're (laughs) really... These movies are awful. Super popular. I I can't I know they're popular. I've never seen one. I've never seen one, so I can't comment on it. But, uh, yeah, I mean, they've done nine of them. They still well, do great yeah. box office. They do great box so, office, yeah. Well, so, there was a know. good payoff. It was it was wandering for me a little bit. He just kept going. It was like, it was almost sounded like improv. You know, if you ever take an improv class, theater or whatever. Like, it's like, hey, hey listen. Is going somewhere? She's calling him a puppet with a hand up the butt. Yes, it has a great payoff. Sick burn. Sick that is, burn. That is. Oh, the little green guy? Little green guy. All right, let's uh, wrap things up with just a little listener feedback. How's that sound? Perfect. Let's do it. You must contact me. Play back the entire message. What message? Message after the message. The Emperor commands you to make contact with him. It's a trick. Send no reply. Well, if you listen to our show last week, you know that uh, Jimmy Mack brought us the bottom five Star Wars sound effects. The worst <laughs> Star yeah. Wars sound effects. And uh, Guy English wrote us and said, uh, hey, can we get a top five best sounds in Star Wars? And if the seismic charge isn't on your list from Attack of the Clones, uh, then you're just wrong. And that's okay. You guys are awesome. So Guy must have liked it, but he wants to hear your top five best star wars sound effects is that a challenge i do have a top five list oh you do and this and 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 i'm sorry guy but the seismic charge is nowhere near that list i don't even think the seismic charge would make my top 10 no i'll be honest with you really i i find it pretty uh straightforward it's an explosion with with uh you know somebody like hit some piano strings or so i got a guitar right here there you go there it is that's it that's it. Seismic charges. Seismic charges. Mm-hmm. I, I don't even have to be in tune to make that sound effect. No, it's, it's better if you're not, I think. Was that sound effect well executed in the film? Was it just the right sound effect for just that moment? Absolutely, yes. I, I, I won't ever crap all over the genius of Ben Burt, but I, I, I was shocked last year in the Mandalorian when the slave one showed up and dropped those seismic charges Mm -hmm. and a lot of buzz online, people saying the greatest sound effect ever created for star Wars. And I, 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 again, probably wouldn't even make my top 10 list because when you think about greatness, when it comes to star Wars sound design, you have to go big or go home. And when I say go big, I'm talking about the voice of R2D2 an entire character created via sound design with some of the most unique sounds you've ever heard. The combination of mechanical and organic to make R2 come to life and to provide so much character to that trash can on wheels is simply a feat of sound design that I am still in awe of. 
One time I got to visit Ben Burt's studio and I got to play with the synthesizer, the original synthesizer that he used to create the voice of R2-D2. And it, there's a bunch of post-it notes and stickers on it. You know, don't touch this setting. Don't touch this setting. <laughs> <laughs> You're pushing all the buttons. Yeah. yeah. Flipping the dials. I, it's, I mean, just the epic nature of how R2's voice was created puts it at the top of my list of all-time Star Wars sound effects. Number two, the lightsaber. <laughs> the lightsaber. That entire, I mean, who doesn't hold the Christmas wrapping paper tube when it's empty and right. go? We even saw actors in the prequels and the sequels rehearsing with lightsabers, making that noise. Yep. What a great sound. And one of the most iconic sounds in the history of cinema sound. And it's definitely on my top five. The blaster sound, or as, as you youngins like to call it, the pew pew, which by the way, <laughs> that pew pew thing is like fingernails on the blackboard to me, uh, which is something I said several times last week when I was talking about my worst sounds in Star Wars, but the actual sound effect, Ben Burt out at some control tower tapping on the support wires to get that sound. We've all seen that footage. From the old making of oh, yeah. specials. And it just is a great sound because he also incorporated actual gunfire sounds into it. So yeah. you have that zap sound, but you also have a, a bang with it. Yep. And I the laser it so and the explosion. Yeah, both. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And it just is the best sounding laser gun, ray gun in the history of movies. Yeah, I mean, compare it to that, Star Trek. Yeah, it's like that. Yeah. You'd have noises. Or, like It sounds like that. Yeah. It, that, mm -hmm. that, doesn't, that doesn't get me pumped up like, a, you know, the blaster bolts do. That's just one of the greatest sound effects ever, ever created. Put in my top five Chewbacca's roar. Mm. Chewbacca's language, based on recordings made and edited together very carefully of bears and seals and uh, sea lions and put together in just such a fashion that really brings Chewbacca to life. I mean, my God, it's, what they did there. I mean, Ben Bird, he'd been working on these sounds for years before they even stepped in front of camera. Well, at least a year. And the stuff he was coming up with was just mind blowing. And the characters he, he brought life to was incredible. Chewbacca, iconic, can't do better than that. Um, and then to round out my top five, my favorite vehicle sound in the history of Star Wars is the TIE Fighter. The TIE Fighter has just such a great otherworldly sound to its engines, but it also fits the design of the ship in such a way that it all makes sense when you see it on film. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's exactly what a TIE Fighter is supposed to sound like. Exactly. And the TIE Fighter makes my top five. It was incredible how Bert created it by slowing down an elephant roar and adding the sound of tires on a highway running on wet pavement. Oh, wow. <laughs> well, mean, when you it, break it down, crazy. you can and, hear it, you know? And you hear that when it's, the tires, you know, because the TIE fighter makes that that you can sort of pick apart and go, oh, yeah, that's it. That's an elephant roar. And then as it moves off into the distance, you hear this sound that accompanies it and that's the tires on the wet pavement wow. and it's just brilliant it's brilliant yeah. and then i'll give you know um notable mentions to the jawa voice the tauntaun <laughs> um the tuscans the tuscans was uh simply taken from donkey's brain when they were bringing gear down in the canyon where they shot tatooine scenes in tunisia 
They were bringing along these donkeys, and George said, "Hey, somebody record that and send that to Bert." <laughs> and and Ben turned it into the classic Sand People Tuscan Raider. <laughs> Uh, one time I was visiting Matt Wood at Skywalker Sound. Me and Wendy were there. And he had found all of these reels in storage because they were putting together the Willow Blu-ray. Mm. And so he was looking for audio from Willow and he came across a ton of Star Wars stuff. And he found the actual reel that had the audio recorded in Tunisia of the donkeys that got wow. turned into the Sand People Roar. And so he he digitized it and then played it back for me and Wendy. And it was so funny just to hear these donkeys just carrying on. Like just like you'd hear donkeys. But then at one point the donkeys get excited and you're just, holy crap, they're it's sad people. I don't believe it. And that was the, oh, and I've, I've begged Matt many times. I, can you just play that at a convention or something? So people can hear that also on the reel was audio recorded at Alec Guinness's birthday, which they celebrated in on Tunisia. the set, right? Yeah. Re, yeah. Well, on not the, on set. the set. Yeah. But on location. And so uh, Mark's there and they're all drinking a champagne toast and Mark goes, I don't know if I should. I don't know. And 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 Sir Alex is to Hamill. He goes, Oh son, it's perfectly fine in this occasion to imbibe a little bit. <laughs> Mark's just like, okay. You know, well, if Sir, if Big Al is doing it, I'm gonna be doing it. And then uh they have a cake, they bring out a cake for Alec Guinness. And George Lucas goes, hey, it looks like a pizza. <laughs> it's, it's the wildest audio I ever heard. I heard it just at one time when wow. Matt found it while he was working on the Willow Blu-ray, and he played it for me, and it blew my mind. And I've been lobbying for them to release it or play some of it at a convention or something, and uh, yeah, yeah, they don't listen to me. But uh, <laughs> those are those are just some on my list. Did I say the Probot? Did I say the Probot? You didn't say the Probot, but you. I love the probot. honorable mentions to the, the Probot. Ad-Nets? Did I mention the Anats? Did I mention the carbon freezing platform crane mm, that that's adds a good one. the most eerie touch to that moment when one of our heroes gets incapacitated by the carbon freezing process and what? they put that. Well, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's another one that you, you forgot to mention and that's uh, Darth Vader's breathing sound. Darth Vader's breathing. Uh, uh, another perfect example. Ben Burt in his studio has a trophy case. And in it, he has certain knickknacks and gadgets that he had uh, acquired over the years. And in there is the scuba regulator that he used <laughs> to create the Darth Vader breathing. He just mic'd it up. <sighs> I think that he might have added a little special sauce to that as well. But again, another great achievement in sound audio design for films and all of that stuff outweighs <laughs> that's going to be on my next album i'm just going to call it seismic charge and it's going to be uh two sides side a and side b of nothing but let's do a chord all right, now I'm so. It sounds like the chord of Q right there. Yeah. <laughs> Jimmy no. Mac playing a Q. <laughs> oh, there you go. Another Rebel Force Radio in the can. Thanks, everybody, if you're uh, tuning in and listening. That is our preferred way of you to support us here at Rebel Force Radio. Just listen, listen to the show, tell your friends about it. But uh, if you want more, do you see my guitar strap? Oh, yeah. You got the Wookiee guitar strap. Look at yeah, that. Yeah, it's a it's Chewbacca Wookie. bandolier. That's fantastic. Yeah. I'm a full time Wookiee. Man, oh, man. No wonder you're known as the Wookiee of the neighborhood. If you want more of that, you, <laughs> the best way to get it is Rebel Force Radio on Patreon. That's right. The easy way to find it is just to go to rebelforceradio.com and click on the Patreon banner and boom, you're transported over to our Patreon and you can sign up. Uh, there's various membership levels and there's all kinds of perks that go with those levels. Everything from a dollar a month all the way up to, you know, some higher uh, prices, you know, RFR VIP. There's also an $11.38 a month. We had to. $11.38. 
for Rebel Force Radio All Access, and you get lots of stuff, including the ability to watch this show as we record it. Not live, but, you know, you can uh, watch the uh, antics of uh, Jimmy Mack and his uh, Wookiee guitar strap mm -hmm. trying to make those seismic charge sounds. That's just one of the many, many perks. Uh, also, uh, there's a podcast that you can't subscribe to on Apple Podcasts or on Spotify. No, no, no. These are unique to Rebel Force Radio's Patreon, like RFR Comlink, the Q&A, the Babu Freaks, as we were talking about before. Uh, Clone Wars Declassified Remastered. So if you're binging for the first time or re-binging on uh, Clone Wars on uh, Disney+, Plus, you can have a listen of our reviews of uh, each and every episode there. Uh, also, it is the exclusive home to uh, really one of the one of the best, if not the certainly the best, uh, when it comes to uh, the music of Star Wars, Star Wars Oxygen. Those archives only available through uh, RFR on Patreon. And when we get around to doing those live after shows, which we will honor about December 29th with the premiere of the book of Boba Fett, one way to get to the head of the queue of those live call-in shows is identify yourself as a Patreon member, and uh, we'll make sure we get to your call. So please join a community of some of the greatest Star Wars fans in the galaxy. Go to details at uh, patreon.com slash rebelforceradio or the website rebelforceradio.com. Also, another way you can help us out, support our sponsors. They support us, so please support them. Uh, big thanks to Shopify and Indeed this week. Don't forget, if you'd like to see Rebel Force Radio live in person, we are going to be in Nashville at ICCCon. Uh, you can go to ICCCon.com and get tickets uh, for this uh, event in Nashville, and that's in March 2022. Use the code RebelForce10 at checkout and you save 10% off the gate price. Uh, RFR is available on YouTube and um, great stuff over there at YouTube. I'll see if I can get a little more of our uh, trick or treat stuff uh, up there as well. So if you want to see more of the little, I, we were calling him instead of the Mandalorian, the Boy DeLorean. <laughs> Boy DeLorean. Boy DeLorean. I get um, it, man, boy. boy yeah, you got man. it, right. Yeah, it's over at youtube.com slash Rebel Force Radio. Costs you nothing. Just hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. And that's the uh, also the way you'll be notified when we're going live and doing these live shows. But above all, we'd like to hear from you in between shows. An email address is show at rebelforceradio.com. Voicemail line 708-320-1RFR. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and the official website for all things and everything, Rebel Force Radio, rebelforceradio.com. And uh, as I say, you'll find us on just about anywhere you can find podcasts. So please subscribe. And if the podcatcher of your choosing allows you to do so, we'd love to have a review. Just one rule, please. Make them good. All right, that's it. We'll see you next time for Rebel Force Radio. I'm Jason. I'm Jimmy Mack. And remember. The Force will be with you always. Yoda's a puppet with someone's hand up his ass. <laughs>